All right, so picking up where we left off, I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep cycle and architecture. So we already kind of determined that there's this non-REM where you have the slow rolling eye movements in REM, and they don't occur randomly. I was saying before that there's cycles, there's rhythms to this process, so it's not just a random occurrence when you're in non-REM versus REM, and that happens throughout the night, and they alternate in that rhythmic fashion. In healthy individuals, the cycle usually begins with non-REM 1, and then progresses through non-REM 2, 3, 4, 3, 2, and REM, and then finally REM. So it's kind of like, as you can see, it's a process from non-REM 1 to 2, to 3, to 4, to 3, to 2, and then into REM. And this pattern repeats itself approximately every 90 to 120 minutes, about 3 to 4 times per night. So it's happening multiple times, and it's occurring in roughly this 90 to 120 minute um, intervals. Now, the one nuance point I'll say here, which is a little bit of a nuance point and has changed recently, is that they took away stage four. So really, there is no stage four anymore. It's now only non-REM one, two, and three. Because really, stage three and four were both delta wave. They were both slow wave sleep. And it really doesn't matter. It, they were essentially the same. So the distinction really didn't make any sense. So now the cycle would look something like non-REM 1 to non-REM 2, then 3, 3, 3, back to 2, and then finally REM, if you're following the new pattern. Again, not really a big deal, but just something that's changed more recently, where, they, where they've kind of consolidated stages 3 and 4. So again, the non-REM stage 3 is most prominent at the first half of the night and diminishes later in the night, and REM sleep, of course, is less prominent in the first half of the night, and increases. So REM sleep will actually increase as the night progresses and non-REM will decrease as the night progresses. So they're like a sort of opposing process. Sleep latency, so this is an important definition and one you'll definitely want to remember. Sleep latency is usually 10 to 20 minutes and it's the time from lights out to non-REM stage 2. So the key point there is it's not the time from lights out to non-REM 1, it's the time from lights out to non-REM 2 and that takes about 10 to 20 minutes. REM latency, on the other hand, is another definition you're gonna to wanna to know. So REM latency is the time from sleep onset to, of course, the first REM cycle, and we had already said that this is like roughly 90 to 100 minutes. So REM latency, time from sleep onset to first REM. And sleep efficiency, this is a bit of like an equation, total sleep time divided by total sleep recorded time, and that's multiplied by 100. That, equa that definition is not really as important for you. They're not going to ask you to make that calculation on a test or anything like that. However, if you're planning on doing a sleep fellowship, you're going to want to know it. So this is the typical diagrams that you see. And again, I kind of said that stages three and four were the same. And if you turn your attention to the sleep stages diagram there, stage one, we have the theta waves. Stage two, light sleep. And that's where you're going to see your um, K complexes and sleep spindles and K-complexes. So in stage two, you're gonna see light sleep, um, K-complexes, and uh, sleep spindles. So that's definitely something you'll wanna remember as well. And again, stage three and four kind of delta waves, like I said, it's slow, slow wave sleep, and that tends to be the same, so they consolidated to just stage three now. But, you know, the delta waves still remain the same. And of course, REM. REM looks almost like the stage one, it looks similar to the um, the wake period, actually, when people are awake. So the, the pattern looks very, very similar. So the next table over here, human sleep stages distribution. So this kind of gives you the breakdown of the various recording devices that will be used in polysomnography. So in the wake state, you see alpha waves, 8 to 14 hertz. The EMG shows, of course, muscle tone and activity. The extraocular muscles are variable eye movements, they're seeing eye movement, and this is about 5% of the nocturnal distribution. So non-REM stage 1 is theta waves, they're 4 to 7 hertz. There is muscle tone and activity present, and this is where you start to see the slow rolling eye movements that we described at the beginning. And this is about approximately 2 to 5% of nocturnal distribution. Non-REM stage 2, again, this is where you see the sleep spindles, 12 to 14 hertz. And I'll just use the mouse real quick to kind of point that out. That would be right in this area here. And the K-complex is over here. So theta waves, 4 to 7 hertz, sleep spindles, K-complexes are there. 
but obviously muscle tone and activity is present, but it begins to slow at this point. You still have the slow rolling eye movements, because remember the slow rolling eye movements are characteristic of non-REM sleep. It was something they determined early on, back in the history portion of this lecture. And the nocturnal distribution is somewhere between 45 and 55 percent, so this is quite a bit of your sleep. Now non-REM, again, I said 3 and 4 are now just 3, so that's really just non-REM stage 3, this delta waves, and I said the delta waves are slow wave, and this about, and this is marked by decrease in muscle tone and activity, and again, slow rolling eye movement, so most of that stuff doesn't really change other than from non-REM to 1 to non-REM 3, you start to see this decrease in muscle tone and activity, but not completely gone. Slow rolling eye movements present in all of them, and again, the nocturnal distribution highest in non-REM 2 and uh, 3, whereas 1 is really only 2 to 5 percent. So, finally, you'll eventually go through the stages and reach REM, and in REM, you have relatively low voltage mixed frequency waves. So again, I said that's similar to the awake state. So if the person were having a, this recording done on EEG and they were awake, it would look similar to what REM sleep looks like. The EMG findings, obviously REM sleep, you have an absence of muscle activity and you get more of this conjugated rapid eye movements. This accounts for approximately 20 to 25 percent of your sleep distribution. So the next thing I want to discuss is the circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is important because it acts as our biological clock. It's an endogenous rhythm of bodily functions and it's influenced by certain environmental cues, particularly light. The cycle is unique for each person, So, and this is an important point that you want to remember, is it averages 25 hours. So we think of a day having 24 hours, but the circadian rhythm doesn't operate that way. It actually operates with an average of 25 hours and can be as long as 50 hours in some cases. Sleep disorders related to circadian rhythm emerge whenever the individual circadian rhythm clashes with environmental and societal expectations. So what you mean by that, or a good example of that, is like shift work disorder where somebody has to work night shifts in, say, a hospital as a resident physician. You may be asked to work the night shifts for a month, and if you're asked to do that, then obviously your normal circadian rhythm, you're going to be, you know, fighting with it. You're going to be wrestling with it because you're, no, you're going to be working while, when normally you would be sleeping. So that's obviously going to be one of the things that will disrupt your normal rhythm. Um, and the, the chart here really just kind of shows you starting, let's start, say, at midnight and work our way, work our way around. So at midnight... You get your deepest sleep around 2 a.m., lowest body temperature at 4.30. These are kind of like little details. Highest testosterone secretion at 9, highest alertness at 10, 12 noon, um, not really much going on there. Best coordination is around 2.30, fastest reaction time around 3.30. Um, greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength around 17, um, which would be 5 o'clock. And highest blood pressure at 1830. So it's, it's kind of a weird cycle, but the melatonin secretion, of course, beginning at 2100, which would be uh, 9 p.m. So th that kind of shows you that there's all these various endocrine functions. There's secretion of testosterone. There's uh, melatonin secretion, of course. There's certain, there's cortisol. Um, you have your lowest body temperature. So there's a lot of things that are going on during this process. And again, it's kind of well mapped out. I wouldn't say that these are hard and fast times, but they're just, you know, approximations of when certain things happen. And again, that average is about 25 hours for most people. Sleep across the lifespan. So obviously, as you age, sleep changes. So the amount of time spent in different stages of sleep varies with age. And we can see that from the chart here. Infants spend more time then infants spend more than two-thirds of their time a day sleeping, whereas adults spend less than one-third. So obviously sleep decreases or the need for sleep decreases as you age. And of course, elderly people tend to have a lot of trouble with sleeping in general. So elderly experience a decrease in intensity, depth, continuity of sleep. And that's secondary to what they believe to be age-related degenerative changes in the sleep mechanism in CNS. So as you age, you know, obviously there's insults, there's just chronic chronic damage that occurs, and that's going to affect your sleep cycle as well. 
Specific changes include, include increased sleep latency, so increased time to the onset of sleep, reduced non-REM stage three, decreased REM latency, so decreased REM latency, so you'd enter REM earlier is what that means. You'll enter REM sleep earlier than the normal 90 to 100 minutes. Reduced total REM time, or reduced total REM amount, and, if, and you have frequent awakenings and decreased sleep efficiency. So, as you age, sleep becomes, as you can see, more and more of a problem, and it's not necessarily because of any underlying psychiatric disorder per se, it's more so related to other, other details. And the chart kind of lays that out for you. So time in bed at birth, obviously, is 17 to 24 hours. That's most of the day. Um, time of sleep is approximately 16 hours. And the breakdown of stage 1, stages 3, and REM are kind of there as you age. We, we hear a lot about adolescence and needing more sleep. So they do need a little bit more sleep. The time in bed is approximately 8.5 hours. They need about 8 hours of sleep. And that changes as you get older, you get into your middle age, you know, 25 to 45, seven and a half hours is adequate. Most of, most people are sleeping approximately seven hours and 20% of that is REM. And again, as you age, that changes more and more. And uh, some of the specific changes that happen to elderly populations are, again, that's increased sleep latency. So increased time to falling asleep and getting to that non-REM stage two. Reduce non-REM 3 and 4 because that's the restorative sleep, so they get less restoration. Decrease REM latency, reduce total REM amount, and frequent awakenings and decrease sleep efficiency. So it's like pretty much everything is affected in the elderly population to some degree. The neuroanatomic basis for sleep. So this is just a little understanding of some of the basics. You want to remember some of these details for sure because they are testable points. So the actual neuroanatomic basis for sleep wake cycle remains somewhat elusive. So we again we don't actually know the whole neuroanatomic basis for sleep wake cycle. And again, this goes back to my point that we don't know as much about sleep as I feel like we should. The suprachiasmatic nuclei is a collection of 50,000 cells in the anterior hypothalamus. It's a brain region that moderates the sleep wake demand and environmental demand. So again, that, that's the key point that you want to know is that a lot of this rhythm is based in the our circadian rhythm is occurring in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's this 50,000 cells in the anterior hypothalamus. So you want to know location, remember the name associated with the sleep cycle. You want to remember melatonin because we believe melatonin is a neuropeptide secreted from the pineal gland. So you want to remember that melatonin secreted from the pineal gland. And it's associated with suppression of the suprachiasmatic nucleus and induces sleep in mammals. But does not have a clear role in sleep homeostasis. So it's kind of strange. It induces sleep in mammals. And again, that sort of starts to get secreted around 9 p.m. A lot of it's based on, again, light. So at 9 p.m. it's pretty dark out. And so melatonin begins to be secreted. Wakefulness is also ma maintained by tonic activity of the reticular activating system. So again, this reticular activating system plays a very strong role in sleep. It also plays a role in delirium, obviously, and that's where the whole like, sort of acetylcholine um, concept comes from as well, and strong and is strongly influenced by sensory stimuli. So again, the strong sensory stimuli that affect the reticular activating system are mainly pain and sound. And sleep develops when there's decreased activity in reticular activating system. So sleep starts to become induced when the activity in reticular activating system starts to decrease. And that's combined with the whole melatonin secretion as well, but we don't, again, have a clear role for it in sleep homeostasis. I'm going to cut it there. I think that's long enough. The next video will cover the sleep-wake disorders, so we'll go over all the sleep-wake disorders and uh, DSM-5 criteria, etc.